Fuck this entire indifferent, hypocritical, and violent world. That's how philosopher George Yancey opens his article in Truth Out. But let me just say he has stars instead of the word. The article's called, If the State of the World Makes You Want to Scream, You're Not Alone. And I think that's a sentiment many of us feel. Given what we face with the rise of the right wing, the war in the Ukraine, the ineptness of Democrats here in the United States to resist or blunt the right, to witnessing the pervasive racism that plagues this nation and the world. I'm Mark Steiner, and welcome to The Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. It's good to have you all with us. Dr. Yancey's article in Truth Out, If the State of the World Makes You Want to Scream, You're Not Alone, and others like Anti-Black Racism is Global, So Must Be the Movement to End It, are really connected. George Yancey is the Samuel Candler Dobbs Professor of Philosophy at Emory University, Montgomery Fellow at Dartmouth College. He's the author, editor, and co-editor of over 20 books, including Black Bodies, White Gazes. Look, a white backlash, what happens when we talk honestly about racism in America and Across Black Spaces, Essays and Interviews from an American Philosopher. And welcome back, George. It hasn't been been a while since we've talked, and it's good to have you on the air with us again. Yes, it has. I appreciate it very much. You know, I was thinking about the title of the article. This this is often a sentiment that creeps into my brain and soul. It it feels as if sometimes the forces of history and life are just arrayed against us. I'd like to hear how you kind of came to to the need to write this article. Um, and what it just says about the state we're in. Yeah, sure. Um, it took me a while, actually, to write that that piece. It had what was going on in the Ukraine. Uh, in fact, even the death of, the killing, I should say, of George Floyd, having that knee on his neck for over nine minutes. Right. Um, COVID-19, all of that had sort of constituted a kind of confluence. And so there was this immediate influx a kind of uh, gestalt-like, overwhelming feeling of rage. And by the time I decided to read a little more of uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who talks about the the prophet's word as a scream in the night, and the idea that what we have failed to do is to be outraged by the existential gravity of the problems that we face, I think then I could actually articulate the piece. And the reason that I started out with the expletive, the F word there, is because it, for me, embodied that sense of um, that sense of heaviness, that sense of dread and catastrophe, that was hard to sort of find a kind of proper grammar. So I felt that that expletive would sort of do it for me. And the idea of screaming uh, suggests the sense in which we are outraged, the sense in which um, we can't even clearly uh, and with ease communicate these issues the idea of you know abstract thought or abstract thinking or abstract discourse is always already too late there is the emotive and affective dimension because of the existential hell that we find ourselves in such that perhaps what we need to do is scream Mm. so so what it was it was a delay right it was a delay of my waiting and waiting and yet feeling these incredible emotions this sense of crying, this sense of lamentation. And I felt that I needed to say something. And sort of that's how it sort of poured out of me. And so, um, you know, you write about Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and his daughter Susanna said that he couldn't pray because because whenever I open the prayer book, I see before me images of children burning from napalm. So I, as I read that and thought about the title of what you what you wrote and thought about the despair people feel, what do you think has changed in the sense that when Heschel said that, it wasn't like, I can't handle this anymore, I got to go. I can't, I can't even look at it anymore. His response was, I may not be able to pray, but I'm going to act. Whether it was against the war or was it, whether it was walking with Martin Luther King. Um, and he to change the world, for tikkun olam, to, to repair the world. Has something changed? Uh, I don't think so, actually. I mean, Heschel was writing at a time when, of course, he's taking on the kind of white supremacy that Martin Luther King is fighting against, right? So he's he's right there on the forefront um, thinking about and feeling with Martin Luther King this very— and, of course, against the war as well, which, of course, Martin Luther King got into trouble for doing so. In fact, uh, Martin Luther King was very unpopular 
during that period because there were individuals who said, even black folk, who said, look, uh, arguing, you know, trying to, to consolidate um, civil rights is one thing, but you now have stepped beyond, as it were, your calling mm -hmm. when you call into question something like the, the Vietnam War. And I think that that sense of malaise has not changed. If anything, I'd want to say uh, there's a way in which the subtlety and the uh, insidiousness, and yet at the same time, the re-expression of unabashed white supremacy and war, right? Um, none of those things are new to us, but there's a level of intensity. There's a level of um, a sense in which there's a feeling that we should have we should have been done with this a long time ago, right? So there's this case in which there's the um, recursive nature of this violence, the recursive nature of white supremacy. And I think you're right about Heschel. I think in the end, what Heschel is saying is that what we need to do is get out and engage in a form of political praxis. But what I'm interested in is the way in which Hegel, oh, Hegel, Hegel I was going to call him Hegel for a moment. The way in which, well, well you see, because Heschel's a brilliant philosopher. Right, exactly. Way, no, I understand. Right, right, the way in which Heschel is saying, I can't pray, because when I open the prayer book, I see, you know, children being bombed with napalm. That that captures for me the weight. So that, for example, when I'm teaching, when I'm teaching a text, my question is, how do we go on? How do we read? How do we engage in formal academia with all of its abstraction and preoccupation with abstraction and with theory, by the way, which theory comes from the term theoros, which means spectator? How do we continue to be spectators and not cultivate this sense of outrage, the sense that we can't read the prayer book. The Bible's not sufficient. The Quran is not sufficient, you know, um, that we can't remain in the mosques. We can't remain in the temples. And there's something about that. It says that, and for Heschel, as with King, I'm, I would argue that both of them see that the importance of transforming society is a cooperative enterprise with the divine. I mean, in essence, that's kind of what they're arguing. It's not human beings who will bring about the, the transformation of society without being in cooperation with a divine being, and it's not a divine being that will alone do this. So it's a joint process. It's a co-creative process. But again, what Heschel does, there's this kind of existentialist dimension to Heschel, where he places so much weight on us, where, for example, he says, all of us are responsible um, or few of us are guilty, but all of us res are responsible. Right. So I wanted to capture in that piece, let's call it the use of the F word piece. I wanted to capture that sense in which we all have to rise to the occasion to really articulate and to define how it, what it means to be really responsible. For an example, Susan Sontag says, you know, when we're looking at images, for an example, although she's not alive, she would say when we're looking at images from the Ukraine, there's a way in which we can look at those images and we can show sympathy. But sympathy itself tricks us into assuming that we're innocent, that somehow we are detached, we are de disarticulated from the violence that's happening in the Ukraine, when in fact we're not. In fact, sympathy counterintuitively can render us impotent and in some sense apathetic, because what we should be focusing on is how is it that we can make a difference? And again, that brings us back to Heschel. What he sees in the prayer book is the horrifying, catastrophic images of children burning. What I see when I read an abstract philosophical text is George Floyd cr crying and screaming for his mother, calling for his mother. Or I see him saying, I can't breathe. Or I think about the way in which uh, Ukrainian women are, are being raped uh, by Russian soldiers. I think about the, the, the body pieces, the way in which corpses are, const are, are lying in the streets, and the streets are becoming sites of putrefaction, and hence back to death, the immediacy and the importance of death. I think that what Heschel's doing, I think that what King was doing, I think that what I'm trying to do in that piece is really to raise a level, not just of critical consciousness, but to open up our hearts to, in some sense, 
uh, create uh, what I would call an unsuturing of our hearts so that we can feel more and be motivated, motivated by the, the, the gravitas of that feeling, the feeling that we can't go on unless there's a radical transformation in the way in which we've been living. I, I wonder, you know, as I, uh, this, is, this is kind of a more political question, but it really erupted as I was reading your, your pieces uh, in Truth Out recent, uh, and that led to this conversation. And I, I wonder if when, when, you, when, when you and others and many of us want to say we want to scream, um, given what we, the world is facing, something seems to me to have changed drastically. Uh, over the last 50 years and um, uh, where the left has been diminished, where the right is really on the rise, where racism, even though um, there was this flourish of change uh, in 1960s and 70s, um, that, that, that the deeply embedded racism that we see has, has erupted again in response, I think, to everything that was pushed forward. It was like, you know, if you think about if you think about the Reconstruction period here in the United States, um, when when there was this 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 a, a real attempt on parts of some to build a multiracial democracy, and of course that was an anathema to many in the South, white people in the South, and and it erupted and destroyed everything that was built. The same thing, that dynamic seems to be happening again. So when I read that title, um, that's what that's what it, that, that's where it took me politically. Of why we are there and what does that mean? How would you approach that? Sure. I, I think that one, I would think about um, Robin Kelly, the brilliant historian oh, yeah. uh, who actually talks about uh, sort of three reconstructions, one of which, of course, happened after 1877, uh, what well, actually ended in 1877. Uh, and then around the 50s and 60s, let's call it this, the second um, the second um, um, reconstruction, but then he talks about a third reconstruction that's necessary, and sort of he sees that as having great potentiality in this moment. So he take for an example uh, the argument against uh, policing and defunding the police. He says, like you know, look, it's not the case that we need better jails. It's not the case that we need um, better prisons or better policing. He argues that we have, along with others, is that we have to do away with the logics of policing and the logics of prisons. And of course, that doesn't mean that we don't give attention to um, individuals who engage in violent acts. It doesn't mean that we throw law out of the window. Rather, we understand the society um, with greater compassion, and we understand the mechanisms, the systemic rec me um, mechanisms that underwrite the the American polity. Whether we're talking about um, criminalization, uh, questions of, um, of of racism, whether we're talking about uh, qu questions of the opioid crisis, there's a certain kind of compassion that we have failed um, in terms of. In terms of seeing the world, so what? So what? So what? Robin Kelly is saying, is, I think, is something quite radical. He's saying that uh, what we've what we've done is that we have allowed the society uh, to go on too long without looking at it through a critical lens that is capable of taking us to this radically new place, such that we're able to transgress both. I think the left and the right. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats, that we have to really rethink the human, rethink the anthropos, and to rethink that with a level of passion so that we can all develop a kind of common discourse to understand the ways in which all of us mutually suffer in the structures that we've created so that it's, not, it's no longer zero-sum logics where some win and some gain, gain, which is precisely, of course, the logics that both Democrats and Republicans are playing according to. So he's suggesting something far more radical, something far more inclusive and yet critical. So, you know, I mean, you, and all the things you've re written over the years, I've read a lot, of, a, a lot of what you've written over the years. Um, so, and I think of you kind of a, as a, 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 in some ways as a practical, pragmatic, applied philosopher. You think about mm. how the world should be. 
So, yes. so t given what you just said, so what form does that take? I mean, if you are, if you are, are let me go back to what I said earlier, because I think this is part of the what, the what we're facing in the world today is that because of the failures in many ways out of the West um, to better people's lives, there's a rise of the right, and it's very powerful. And and the the left, which for the most part was born of not just Marx but also of humanism and more, um, has been diminished in many ways. And 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 you're seeing right now with the, what's happening in the Ukraine, where people, um, where the, both the right and the left are split over what to do about the Ukraine. What does it really mean? You know, sh should I should I support Russia? Or should I support the Ukrainians? I mean, it's you know, and you see you see that happening in both spectrums. So, what form do you think that takes? Both sure. in, in human, humanly and politically. Yeah, I look. I th I think that um, I think that for me, when I think of left like thinkers, I think of Robin Kelly. I think of the left bell hooks. I mean, the late bell hooks. Of course, the left bell hooks. I think of Cornel West. I think of other figures. Um, and what I see uh, in their paradigmatic way of thinking about the world is really um, rethinking uh, limited ideological boundaries. So I think uh, the right um, is, is living in a world that is upended precisely by its, its contradictions, precisely by the fact that um, its notion of what it is has been completely transformed um, in the light of someone like the strongman narcissist Donald Trump. So it seems to me that for the most part, conservatives will sell their souls as long as they get more votes, and as long as they get more votes, meaning as long as there's a populist figure who is capable of confusing the truth from lies and lies from truth. So I think there what we've got is simply the investment in how to gain more power. So that's, the, it seems to me, the teleological uh, basis upon which the Republican Party uh, is, it moves. That is, that's its raison d'etre. But at the same time, of course, Democrats are beholden to Wall Street. Democrats are beholden to money and to wealth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a way in which I would argue, and I don't, by the way, I've never publicly referred to myself as, as a leftist. But what I, how I do think about myself is in terms of this radical way of thinking about Hesed, the, the, the Hebrew term hesed, which means loving kindness. And I see that work, I see that working in Cornell's work, and namely in West's work, in Robin's work, in Bell Hooks, to name the three of them. There's a way in which they're really thinking about uh, how caritas or how agape can transform the way in which we're thinking about, let's say, take the Ukraine. For the moment, what am I learning? I mean, all of us are learning things like what javelins are, Right. We're learning. I've had like a military lesson in the last few weeks. Right. But that's that's what we're learning about. We're we're hearing it's important to support them militarily. Um, this this and despite the fact that we don't really hear a critical discourse about the way in which, um, you know, uh, Bush said that we wouldn't uh, seniors said that we wouldn't move another inch uh, in terms of NATO vis-a-vis uh, vis -a -vis, uh uh, Europe, um, so or Eastern Europe. So it seems to me there there are contradictions as well. But for me, I think that the real discussion is how do we talk about what it means to show loving kindness? What it, does it mean to lay down the sort of geopolitical, socially constructed distinctions that we have created and that keeps us all imprisoned? Right. So for, so for me, and while this is is it certainly utopic and, and in that etymological <laughs> uh -huh. sense mm -hmm. it does not exist right but i mean what would it look like for a politician for an example to to build their platform on something like hesed on loving kindness what would that look like what are the radical uh, material implications of that kind of of uh, frank speech that kind of parisia that kind of courageous speech so i'm being less political here mm -hmm. and looking at something perhaps <laughs> beyond the political. And for me, that which is beyond the political is that which holds us all together in this incredible way in which we are all haptically connected, the way in which we're all touching based on the fact that 
we're all pro- part of this larger ecosystem uh, that implicates all of us. So it goes back to King's notion of all of us being part of this larger network. It goes back to John Donne, the, the argument where, you know, the, the statement that, you know, one doesn't uh, send, you know, doesn't ask for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, right? And this is what I wanted to communicate in this piece. I want to be able to identify not only with the Ukrainians that are being slaughtered, massacred, but how do we identify with, identify with those Russian soldiers themselves who are part of a system, a totalitarian system, where they too are forced uh, to engage in brutal acts of murder. So it seems to me that I want to raise the, qu- the question of violence and the question of political divisiveness and the question of air spaces, which again is a, is a bizarre notion that countries can own air spaces. <laughs> and I want to liberate that discourse. I want to uh, extricate that discourse from political ideology and talk about something like the power and radicality of love, what Heschel says when he says that how can any of us, if we were really to take on the weight of the world's suffering, how could any of us live in tranquility? So there's a way in which the left and the right bases itself upon a conception of time, as King would say, that is always waiting to happen. It is always the next thing that's happening. And my sense is that what we need is a post-hope understanding of temporality that says that tomorrow is always too late. But today is the day that we scream. And by the way, when I say scream, I just don't mean that sonically. I also mean that as an embodied form of resistance where we refuse to cooperate with the logics of the world, where we refuse uh, to do politics um, in the way in which we've been doing it, right? Where we demand more in terms of um, care and emphasis upon our very humanity. So in some ways you're saying we, we have to dig, dig deeper in a different way if we're going we're gonna to address this. I'm thinking about the other article that you, that, that you wrote, that black racism is global, uh, so, so must be the movement to end it. And I want to envision that for a minute with you about what about what that means. And 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 this quote you have in here, it really has stayed with me. And it is, um, you you make this comment. Uh, People feign a look of shock when I respond to the world that the world is like Mississippi. Mississippi just owns what it is. Mm. So so is that what I said there? Yeah. So, I'm, so, so, um, so, 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 tell me, so in the face of that, in the face of this, the 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 depth of racism, in the face of the of of the of the death depth of kind of economic exploitation that happens, and then these in these kind of invasions, the United States has taken part in, that Russia has taken part in across the globe. So, I mean, so tell me what kind of response that 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 what you're writing here would be. I mean, give us a sense of what that is. Yeah, I I, I think that. I think that what I'm saying is what we have to do is, I'll put it this way, uh, Judith Butler says that, and it's a fancy way, but it's, it, it gets at what I'm saying. She yeah, yeah. says that we need, we need to create an insurrection at the level of ontology itself. And ontology comes from ontos, which means the study of being. Um, there's this way in which um, what we have to do is not, is not to continue with the same approaches, the same logics that we've been approaching, whether, again, whether it's left, whether it's right, whether it's liberal, whether it's conservative, I think that what we need to do is to rethink the very notion of particularly the neoliberal conception of the self. I think that we have to rethink the idea that autonomy, the very idea that we are separate from each other, the very idea that again, going back to this notion of a zero-sum logics, the very idea that we are these autonomous beings uh, who live according to these artificial distinctions, I think that what we need is to place far more humanity on the fact that life and all of us are fundamentally precarious. We're fundamentally um, always being toward death, to use Heidegger's term, there's a way in which we have a very short period of time where all of us will be dead. And so there's something about the impending doom of death, uh, not just 
violent forms of death, but the fact that it's part of our human condition, it seems to me that ought to motivate the kind of, the kinds of political discourse, if you will, that we engage in, the, the kinds of, the kinds of um, uh, deflationary, I should say, political dis- discourse that we engage in. I think that the, the language of Hesed, I think the, the language of Caritas, I think a figure like Heschel, who basically says, look, that we have lost this outrage, right? And that's what he wants to bring back. And I'm not sure who's outraged. It seems to me as one Slovenian uh, psychoanalyst and philosopher put it, she said that we would rather die than to be scared to death, right? So I think that what we've failed to do is to be scared to death, to be scared to death, to have that push us as an impetus toward rethinking politics, toward reformulating the very discourse that we use, the very idea of thinking about approaches to ending, let's say, the Ukraine war. I think that we need a language that attempts to transcend the old forms of balkanization that are already in place. Now, how do you do that is going to be difficult. Yes. Because, because the discourse of love has very little priority, not only in, our, in the U.S., but in the world. So I think that what we have to do then is to cultivate a new generation of individuals who begin to create forms of alliance across those divisions um, and where forms of strongmen and dictators, which is precisely what we may have in 2024 with the re-election, or so I claim, of Donald Trump. So as a philosopher... Let's say for argument's sake, before we close, a couple things I want to do here. Since you raised these issues you just raised. As a philosopher, if you were sitting with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or many of the other kind of political, rising political figures in this country who are trying to think of a different world. So, and and you are saying that, that, that you, you want to build this world of love and you look at them in a very practical, philosophical way about how you might do that. What would what would you be advising them? Let's say that 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 that, that um, all of a sudden you you were in that position. What would you yeah, say? You, yeah, you know your your questions are so daring. I love them. Uh, <laughs> you, you can't you can't be completely abstract with you. Um, <laughs> you know, which which is which is so important. You know, and, and I think I think part of the the issue here is I'm trying to speak at a level that emphasizes my position while at the same time not having my discourse fall with any category that's much more easier to articulate, mm-hmm. right? So I think that if I were speaking to her, um, I would say something like, uh, what we need is we need to begin to emphasize courageous speech, so hence Parisia, uh, which Foucault says that it is that very idea of bringing one's self to the point of death, the very risk of the possibility of death, personal death here, because of one's own political praxis. But I think that what's important is for those who are more left of center to engage in a form of fearless speech, but also fearless listening, to be able to speak to those individuals who would automatically just try to erase them by a label called being leftist, which of course is a term that has been used and manipulated in such a way precisely to appeal to more white folk, I think, um, who are um, you know, right of center or center for that matter. So to use the term leftist to be synonymous, synonymous with something as ridiculous as you know, communism or you know, Russian totalitarianism. I think that what we need is a way of introducing a radical sense uh, to the to the right to say that, look, there's a way in which we have to come to terms with the history of this country. I would say to her that it's important that we open up um, the consciousness of these individuals such that they're able to come to terms with the historical legacy of 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 anti of anti black racism of the ways in which whiteness has continued to be a dominant force to deal with issues around xenophobia to deal with issues around uh, 
um, a kind of political solipsism. But again, it's hard, right? But I think it seems to me that 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 place of embarkation has to be a place where one attempts to articulate a history that is able to be reveal to those who don't agree with one's own position to see how they're implicated in the very ideological positions that they take hold of. So if you have politicians who have as a backdrop the Bible, then it seems to me that one has to engage in a form of imminent critique to emphasize that Palestinian figure known as Jesus, who would argue that we have failed uh, we have failed precisely at the level of taking seriously who our neighbors are. I mean, how do we communicate with Putin that he is our neighbor? How do we communicate with Russians that they are our neighbors? Well, part of what we have to do is deconstruct the artificial walls that have already been put in place. What we have to do is somehow infiltrate those barriers, literally, <laughs> that are blocking um anything that's contrary to uh, the, the language, the lingua franca of, of a party line kind of discourse. And of course, that's difficult, especially when you live in a society like Russia, where they're literally able, or China, to control communication, what is heard, what goes out. Uh, so that kind of critical discourse is not even being communicated. But again, I think that we need something far more uh, um, that is far more humanistic, uh, that is far more global in terms of how we're thinking about the way in which we're all touching. And it seems to me that COVID-19 should have demonstrated that, but you don't see that. You, you now see precisely a more neoliberal understanding of freedom, which says that what freedom looks like is something like, I don't want to do. It's a negative freedom. I should not have to do X. It's, uh, it's a kind of radical decisionism, which is really all about the self. It's not the kind of responsible agency that, let's say, a Jean-Paul Sartre or Simone de Beauvoir would remind us of. There's a kind of responsibility, a heavy weight that comes with the kind of decisions that we, wear for, that we make, for an example, concerning wearing a mask. I mean, I saw the images of people on airplanes delightfully throwing, laughingly throwing their masks in the trash. But it seems to me that that's part of the problem, is that our understanding of freedom does not take into consideration the welfare of the other. But that's precisely the basis of the U.S., is to precisely get us to think about ourselves in terms of atoms in the void, as neoliberal subjects, as entrepreneurs, where our happiness is really about what we do for ourselves rather than that happiness being inextricably linked. And indeed, our misery and our suffering precisely being linked to those others who suffer. So the language that I'm using, uh, if I'm to avoid just sort of re-articulating a leftist position, um, or certainly not a right position, um, the language, it seems to me, is the language of someone, it, it's a language of a kind of theology, a kind of a theology of love that is not a theological politics or political theology, um, which grounds itself uh, in some perfunctory notion of, you know, God bless America, uh, which ab absolutely means nothing at the end of the day, when in fact we're prepared uh, to leash all hell on those that we've already identified as our enemies. When you when you look at the depth of racism in our world, and how I always I always make this analogy. I think I say that that anti-Semitism runs deep on the planet Earth, um, and it's probably two thousand years old. That modern anti-African racism is maybe at best six seven hundred years old, and it permeates the world and permeate human consciousness. And I think, you know, when I look at the, at the United States today, and you, and way beyond the US, but when I think about the United States today and the younger people in this country than I've, people I've met across the globe, um, is that, is that they, their mindset is changing. Um, I think in part because of all the movements that have forced people to rethink what racism means and how deep it is.
So mm. take what you've been saying because you write a great deal about race, obviously, and you yep. and, and 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 how what you're seeing applies to that, how how it applies to changing that because that to me is, you know, in a in a you know when you when you joked about what I said earlier is because when I was studying philosophy in college, um, I I got into applied philosophy. That was just where my head was. Maybe it mm. still is there, but um, sure. um, but but so the so, so question is what? Let's talk about how you talk about what you're talking about and apply that to, 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 to race and racism and how you sure. to deal with the depth of that because that is what's rising the right. That's what's rising the, the, the most dangerous kind of thing that's kind of a specter on our future across sure. the globe. Sure. You know, I think that, you know, just to say something about philosophy, my in, entry into philosophy, uh, there was a time when I thought about philosophy as a Platonic and Aristotelian, which is to think about philosophy um, as a site of wonder. Right. Um, but because for so many reasons, part of the reason being that I don't know why I'm here, and by here I mean I don't know why I'm here or why any of us are on this planet. We're in the same club. Us. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, um, and also because of uh, uh, you know the death of, of of George Floyd or the death of Alan Kurdi or the death of of, of Ukrainians, um, the death of, of Breonna Taylor, and also the backlash that I often experience when I've when I've written pieces. Um, that are, are, are fairly pr provocative, but are attempting to, uh, you know, I wrote Dear White America in 2015, which I consider to be a letter of love, mm -hmm. in which I received all kinds of hateful mail and was called the N-word probably over a hundred times. So for me now, philosophy is a site of, of suffering uh, rather than just a site of wonder. And I think that, um, I think that what, from what I can tell, um, I, there are some who've argued that the way in which we think about anti-black racism has not fundamentally changed. In fact, some would argue that it's gotten worse. Um, my sense is that as long as white supremacy continues to exist, and by white supremacy, I don't mean those individuals who were in Charlottesville, right? Um, it's amazing, you know, when Anderson Cooper has his black pundits on and they were talking about Charlottesville, and they were all agreeing that what was going on in Charlottesville uh, with the tiki torches and, uh, you know, and, and, and arguing and, and making these claims about uh, blood and soil, um, Anderson Cooper could agree with his black pundits that this is horrible. But no one at any point called into question Anderson Cooper's whiteness. And I, so that for me, uh, I, don't, I don't rely on that tight bifurcation between good whites and bad whites, I think that that distinction creates more trouble. Mm. And while I'm not claiming that, uh, you know, white people that I know are card carrying Klan members or, or part of the Boogaloo <laughs> movement, you know, or the Proud Boys, I want to just make sure that we understand whiteness um, as a, a, a toxic framework uh, to quote David Rodinger, historian of critical whiteness studies, he says that it's not the case that whiteness is only false and possessive. He says that whiteness is nothing more than uh, possessive and false. So my argument is that um, it seems to me that as whiteness continues to grow, because it's this multi-headed, you know, hydra-like beast, uh, if you cut off one head, it grows another. And this is sort of the logics of the 13th Amendment, right? Once you have said, okay, there will no longer be involuntary servitude, you then place into, you put into place black codes so that no longer are black people oppressed because of something called that peculiar institution known as American slavery. They're now oppressed under black codes, right? Under vagrancy, right? right. Uh, then they're put in jail and hence the whole um, prison leasing um, convict leasing program that, that occurred. So hence, in essence, you get a kind of neo-slavery. So for me, I think that as long as whiteness continues to exist, not only as uh, in the form, let's say, of a Donald Trump, but as long as that whiteness continues to exist in a form, let's say, of an Anderson Cooper, where he continues to, to benefit from white privilege, white supremacy, white hegemony, and white power, it seems to me that the question of anti-black racism will not go away. So my argument is a bit pessimist. Mm -hmm. And as much as I argue that black people are sort of at the bottom of 
the rung of society in which there, that place will always be occupi- occupied. So that when you think about the Irish or the Italians or even Jews who came to America, there's a way in which they had an out. And what was that out? And that, by the way, is not to deny the, the horribleness of anti, anti-Semitism by right, no right, means. No, 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 no. But I think that we have to, 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 uh, to recognize the way in which whiteness as a, as it were, a, an attribute of property was able to be possessed by the Italians, the Irish, and Jews. And so we have to think about the ways in which um, black people don't have access to whiteness. Right? Even if we have access to more wealth, nonetheless, we experience over and over again uh, these fundamental instances of either spectacular racism in the form of George Floyd or these microaggressions where we're told things like, you know, I didn't think you were black because you were so articulate or I didn't know you were <laughs> right. black because you were a philosopher, right? So, so what, what, what am I saying then? What I'm saying is that um, I think that it's important, particularly when you think about, um, uh, and, and think about black bodies in, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, anti, anti-black racism is not just specific to the U.S., it's global. I mean, it's in China, it's in Sweden, it's in... Um, it's in uh, New Zealand, uh, and it's and, and it's and it's also in Israel. For an example, if you Absolutely. if you if you read stories about the uh, Ethiopian Jews uh, in terms of the ways in which they undergo go forms of discrimination, it's as if we're reading something that happened um, right here in the United States. So I think that what we need um, that what America needs to do is to come to terms with not just identifying Donald Trump as the epitome of racism or those other um, right-wing conservative individuals, uh, but I think we have to begin to critique and uncover the way in which whiteness as a, as a, a habitual form of iterative practices continue to exist in this country. So for me, until we sort of reach a moment of what I would call not just post-race U.S., but a post-whiteness U.S., I think then we can begin uh, to rethink the ways in which um, black forms of embodiment are, in, are indeed partaking of something called um, uh, a robust sense of humanity. But George Nancy, this has been a great conversation. I was going to try to conclude with what you wrote about the quote from Hiroshima, but I think... Oh, I'm, please do. Uh, I don't mind. Well, I, I was. You. What you said was so good, <laughs> it's so strong. But it, it was a, it was a quote. I think we, to, to leave with, especially in terms of the threat of nuclear war that's upon mm. us uh, in this conflict in Ukraine, which to me is what sets it apart from the horrendous genocides of of of, of Rwanda or Cambodia or many other places I could mention, um, be, because of what it means worldwide in terms of what we face. This is a piece that, that George Yancey put in his article. Um, uh, uh, was written by someone who lived through the uh, nuclear holocaust of Hiroshima. Um, and I think it's something just to think about as we think about what we're facing and what we have to do to not let it happen anywhere again and worldwide. There were no air raid alarms on the morning of August 9th, 1945. We'd been hiding out in the local bomb shelter for several days. But one by one, people started to head home. My siblings and I, in front of the bomb shelter entrance, waiting to be picked up by our grandfather. Then, at 11.02 a.m., the sky turned bright white. My siblings and I were knocked off our feet and violently slammed back into the bomb shelter. We had no idea what had happened. As we sat there shell-shocked and confused, heavily injured burn victims came stumbling into the bomb shelter en masse. Their skin had peeled off their bodies and faces and hung limply on the ground in ribbons. Their hair was burnt down to a few measly centimeters from the scalp. Many of the victims collapsed as soon as they reached the bomb shelter entrance, forming a massive pile of contorted bodies. The stench and heat were unbearable. Have we not learned from this great horror? For some, many, there seems to be no limit to their tolerance for existential devastation, unethical ineptitude, and imperial lust. I'll stop there. The last part was written by our guest, George Yancey. And George Yancey, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have you. 
uh, and look forward to many more conversations as we've had in the past. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network here on The Mark Steiner Show. And let me thank Adam Coley, Kayla Rivera, Cameron Grandino, and Stephen Frank for making this show possible, making all this thing happen for all of us here. Uh, and please, write to me at mss at therealnews.com. Let me know what you think. I'll write you right back uh, as soon as you write to me. So stay involved, keep listening, take care. 